Hello everyone, welcome to video number 7 of chapter 4. We now start chapter 4.4, the duality theorem. We will look at the duality problems from a more abstract viewpoint. Okay, fix some notation. So we'll consider the following setting. We'll consider a max problem. We use the matrix vector compact notation. So maximize z, which is c dot x, subject to the constraint a is the coefficient matrix, a times x is less than b, and x is a restricted. It's a vector or the entrants are bigger than or equal to zero. And we refer to this problem as the max problem, max label. And the dual for this max problem is a minimization problem. So we know that. So we will minimize v, which is b dot y, and the constraint would be a transpose times y bigger than or equal to c, and y is non-negative. And we refer to this problem as d in this chapter. Okay, let's look at our first theorem, theorem 1. It states as follows. If x0 is a feasible solution of the max problem, and y0 is a feasible solution of d, the dual, then I would have c dot x0 less than or equal to b dot y0. Okay? You could uh, um, double check, we went back and refresh the definition of the max and the d. And let's see how we can prove this theorem. Okay, so by assumption, if x is a feasible solution, x0, then x0 satisfies the constraint, which is a x0 less than b. And y0 is a feasible solution of d, that means y0 satisfies the constraint in d, which is a transpose y0 bigger than c. Okay, then um, I can define um, u and v here to be the slacks of these two constraints. They are both vectors here. So u would be b minus ax0. So it's here I move the ax0 to the right-hand side, and then I have b minus ax0, and this quantity here is u. That's the slack. And the v is defined as a transpose y naught minus c. I move the c to the left. Okay? So these will be the slacks of the unconstrained for the max problem and for the dual problem. Then we know that um, because this is feasible solution, then um, b minus ax naught will be bigger than zero. So u is bigger than zero. And by a similar reason, v here is a transpose y0 minus c is bigger than 0 also. So the slacks are non-negative. Okay, so now um, I can, as a, here's a little trick, I can rewrite this equation. I could move this negative one to the other side. I can write it as b equal to u plus ax0. And the same thing here I do, I move the negative c to the other side, and I have a transpose y naught is v plus c. Okay, and now we have prepared ourselves ready. Now we can um, try to show this inequality, and let's start from the right-hand side. b dot y naught. What does that equal to? Well, that equals to... Um, y not transpose times b, right? Because these are all both column vectors. Okay, so what is b? Well, let's use this notation here. b equals 
u plus a x naught. I put it in here, that's b. And now I can distribute, I can distribute this y naught transpose on both terms, so I get one term and two terms with y naught transpose on the left. And let's take a look at each term. So this one is just a dot, y naught dot u. And um, what is this here? Well, this is a, a vector transpose times a matrix times another vector. In the end, this becomes a scalar number, right? This is also a number. It's a number plus a number. Okay, so we're going to write the first here as y naught dot u. And this second term here, since it's just a number, I can transpose it, and I still get the same number. Okay, so I do a transpose on that. So that's our little trick. Okay, so um, so um, for the transpose, we can apply this rule of a transpose, meaning the transpose of the product will equal to the product of the transpose. So this will equal to x not transpose, a transpose, and y not. And we apply the associative rule. We can do this product first. Okay, now we see a t y not. We prepared it here already. It's v plus c, and then we we we'll use V plus C here in this calculation. And then again, we use the distribution rule. I can multiply this by V and multiply this by C. I have two terms, and the transpose times that is the same as the dot product, and that's what I will write. Okay, so we have reached this expression. So let's recall, we started from b times y naught, and then we show that it equal to these three terms. Now I highlighted some terms in red. Why do I do that? Okay, let's look at the first red term. What is y naught? Well, that's a feasible solution, so it's non-negative. And what is u? Well, u is the slack, which is also non-negative, so the dot product is non-negative. The same argument goes here. x naught is a feasible solution, it's non-negative, right, feasible. And the v here is the slack here, is non-negative. So the dot product is non-negative. So these two red terms are both bigger than equal to zero, which just means that this term here is this term plus something non-negative. Therefore, this one is an smaller than that. So we have this inequality, which is what we needed to show. Okay, so this completes the proof of theorem 1. Um, so before we move on, I would like to call your attention to this identity that we have um, derived. You notice I put a star on it. So this identity here will be used a lot in later um, theorems and corollaries. Okay, so equation star. So take another look and uh, we'll refer to that. Okay, let's look at our corollary, a immediate um, consequence of the theorem. Corollary two, it says that um, in the setting of theorem one, we would have b minus b dot y naught minus x naught dot c equal y naught dot u plus x naught dot v. Okay. So the proof is kind of a um, for free. It's immediately from that equation star. Recall I repeated the equation star here and then you, you can just uh, move this to the left hand side and you immediately get that. So there's nothing to prove here. Okay, um, this is a more interesting corollary, number three. Okay, considering the setting of theorem one, if now I shall have 
c dot x naught equal b dot y naught in theorem 1, then I can conclude that this value here is the z max exactly equal to c dot x naught and the v mean will be b dot y naught and then these two equal to each other. Okay, let's see how we can prove such a claim. So let now pick a x1, which is just any feasible solution of the max problem. Okay, then we will use the result in theorem 1. Theorem 1 says if this is a feasible solution for the max problem, then c dot x1, the feasible solution, is less than b dot y naught, which is a, a feasible solution for the dual. So this holds for any x1. Okay, and now we use the assumption of our corollary. A corollary says if I have c dot x naught equal to b dot y naught, if that holds, so then what does this inequality imply? Well, that means this right-hand side here can now be replaced with c dot x naught. Okay, so we have this inequality would hold for any x1, any feasible solution of the max problem. So any feasible solution of the max problem, this dot product, will be bounded by c times x naught is that special one that satisfies this equality. So what does that mean? Well, that simply means c dot x naught here would be the maximum value for z. Okay, and uh, to prove the the mean part, well, a completely similar argument applies. So I will skip that and I encourage you to work it out as a practice. Okay, so um, one more corollary here, the corollary number four, and the statement is the following. If the z in the max problem is not bounded above, then the dual will have no feasible solutions. And similarly, if v in the dual is not bounded below, then the max problem has no feasible solutions. And the proof is um, not too hard. Um, you can follow the similar line of thinking as corollary 3, so um, uh, I will leave it as a homework problem. Okay, so give it a try and um, write out the proof. Okay, so hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you next time.